My name is Teresa Lebowski. I am the SharePoint team lead at, started out as Iberia Bank. We recently merged with First Horizon. And so then there are applications that are owned by each bank and we have to have some cross bank access. Um, so we have some pre-approved applications and then some shared drives and you have to be able to request access to non pre-approved applications uh, as well as laptops actually. So thus I had to create a solution for the cross bank access request. And so just some requirements were that um, because I'm on the Iberia Bank side, of course, I wanted to put it in our SharePoint and we couldn't do it in SharePoint online because First Horizon, um, only a limited number of users have actual uh, M365 licenses. Um, and so also because I'm, I had to use SharePoint because of that, I had to use SharePoint on-prem. I happen to have the license necessary to use Power Automate to connect to on-prem data. So um, this is also exciting because I got to use my license. And I chose Power Automate over SharePoint Designer for obvious reasons. Um, and just there's a link in here. So if you want to download the slides, you can see um, what I'm talking about with those licenses. And so then we'll get straight into the list overview. Um, so knowing that people are not going to fill out the list correctly, um, we put some before you begin information like just on the page. So we actually created a page, um, had the before you begin, then we had the instructions, and then we had the actual request form. Um, and so some of what we had to do was like title fields required field, but we weren't really using it, so we just put a default in there. And then um, required associates uh, requesting information. If we had put this information, which is the description, uh, as the description for associates requiring access, it went at the bottom and they didn't like that. It had to go above. So I had to create a field um, and just put a default value and description so that it would be above. Then we had to have fields that we couldn't hide like we can in SharePoint Online. So um, I had to put a stop here and the default is of course click save and the rest are IT use only, uh, which actually that seems to be working out well. And so then we get into the actual flow in Power Automate. And I decided to use when an item is created or modified, uh, thinking that, hey, people are going to leave out missing information. So they're gonna wanna go back and edit their form and then save it again. So it needs to run through the flow again. So I started noticing all of a sudden that not everything that I can do in Power Automate with a SharePoint online list is available when I'm using SharePoint on-prem list. Um, so this got me kind of thinking about this presentation about doing, uh, pointing out some of the differences. And one of the main differences, actually we'll see that later, but um, you can see that there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, we're used to seeing here. We also saw them in SharePoint Designer, but with SharePoint on-prem, I really only have my fields that are text values. And then um, I, because I, there's no link for uh, the I, item URL or to edit the item, I had just went to use, had and used variables to manually build those links. And then also uh, we have emails that are gonna have to go to different people. There's actually four different email addresses. And knowing again that things change during a merger, I was afraid, hey, those email addresses are going to eventually change. And there are, like seven or nine different emails within this and I didn't want to have to go change everything seven times uh, every time they wanted to change something so I've made variables for those and you can see here um, it was very important to them that they have the item URL that they could click the link and go straight to the item rather than going to the um, just the list and then we had some um, Inf you know, when we, like I said, if they resubmit because they had missing information, um, that's great. We still want it to go through the flow, but if they submit it and the first time everything looks good, then whoever's reviewing it um, goes ahead and changes the status from new to in progress or whatever else. 
Um, so one of the first things that the flow does is actually check the status. Uh, it doesn't need to go through everything before it, if, if we're just going to end up terminating. And so um, you'll notice I did name everything and like here status is not new and um, this is going to come in handy at the end when I see um, when I want to look and see why my, the flow was canceled. Um, you might be wondering why I didn't use get changes for an item or a file. This did not exist when I created this. Um, if you want more information about this action, it's it's somewhat new. Laura Rogers has a great blog post about it, and so I put a link in here to that. And then uh, there were some required fields that we really want them to be required, but they didn't really want a whole lot of required fields on the form. So I had to build into the flow how to check for those and what to do if there, those were missing. Uh, so again, if it something is missing, then it emails the requester to let them know. Um, and then that email has the a link using that variable for the edit item. And then it terminates because there are missing fields, missing uh, information. And I didn't know how many nested conditions you could have. Um, this is like an overview from the first condition um, in the main part of the flow going down. So you can see that I actually ended up with four. And here I'm just going through and listing all of the different conditions. Um, that's not really anything that we need to go into any detail about, I don't think. Hopefully everyone knows what a condition is and how to create it. So I'm just going to go to the end. So uh, my original thought was that I would use um, update item to at the end update the status. Like here you can see I have a uh, flow status, but um, I had things set up as a drop down. Um, and what I'm, and you can see there's no other than the site in the list, there's no drop downs here. And whereas if you're using SharePoint, online there is. And the other thing was, um, so here that kind of shows you that just shows you that there are drop downs available with the SharePoint online. Oh, the other thing was that it created an infinite loop. So I had to take out the update item. Um, I would have gone back and tried to spend more time figuring out how to not create an infinite loop, but they were anxious to get this going. And so once I got everything running, I occasionally will go into the flow run status, view all the runs, see what's been canceled versus failed versus succeeded. Obviously, the succeeded ones I don't really worry too much about. Canceled, it's going to cancel for one of two reasons. Either there was required information missing or the status isn't new. And that could be where someone's gone in and changed the status from new to in progress, well, that will actually launch the workflow. But since the status is not new, it'll cancel pretty quickly. But there's also sometimes it fails. Um, when I had to add a fourth email address, which is the fourth variable to the um, email, the outgoing email, I added it, but the, the system didn't automatically put a semicolon between the third and fourth variables. So it failed because it ran those two email addresses together. Um, and then it gives me pretty good information in this message, letting me know what the um, what the actual error was. And you can see right here, it's got identity management and then uh, .com immediately follows with system access. So I looked at that and was able to see, oh, I need a semicolon. That was a really easy fix. So it didn't take me long to figure out how to fix this and keep it from failing again. And so I had actually planned for 10 minutes thinking that we'd run over because Chris can't usually goes long. <laughs> um, if there are any questions, um, I have uploaded this to um, SlideShare. And you can also uh, hit me up on Twitter or connect with me on LinkedIn. And Vesa, we have five minutes for yeah. So, minutes. so just a few questions related on mm -hmm. on this. And how how long did it actually take you to figure out the and build the whole process in the Power Automate? Um, gosh, it was over a couple of weeks, and I built. I ended up building a really 
long test plan. I was looking to see if I can find it here. I meant to bring it up earlier. There we go. So <laughs> you can see I like tried to account for all of the different scenarios. You can see by the time I started uh, this, what I called the last round of testing, um, I start with uh, number 21 and I actually got down to number 100. So I basically ended up doing 80 tests. And then these ended up all being the same as something I'd already tested. So that's why they're not green. The gray indicated where there should not be any results. And I think the yellow was something uh, that I ended up not using, but I'm just letting me know that, hey, I should be looking for results here. Yeah. So I, I actually so tracked each um, each one so that I could go back and see, oh, well, what, you know, why did it fail or error messages? That's actually a good, good suggestion from Lewis uh, for Power Automate should actually give this kind of a baseline Excel file. This is awesome, by the way, Teresa, just an example on how you're doing testing and how do you validate that the workflow is moving because that wasn't a simple workflow. So really making sure that everything is moving because this one was used by your company for business processes, right? So it really, oh, yes. really it's case. still very active. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But how's your feeling related on Power Automate from a, let's say, it wasn't a super, super easy to do, but then relatively cost efficient, or what's your take on, on using that kind of a tooling for making these business processes? I love Power Automate, even if SharePoint Designer wasn't you know, done with it. Um, and I know we're not using SharePoint Online, but I want to get there. And I also wanted to show the power of Power Automate to the company, especially since they're paying for my license. So I'm 100% in favor of Power Automate. I actually, um, like it more than I like power apps, but I also like automating things more than just making pretty things. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. So yeah, this is this was very exciting for me, even though it took forever. And they have changes and, now. <laughs> yeah, and and the last question to start a career is: that, Did you do any kind of a return of an investment calculation related on this on on kind of a, if we do it in this way versus if we do it in other ways? No, I'm not sure that there was any other way to do it. Um, of course, you could email. always write something completely custom, but then it's completely custom, right? But I'm also not a developer. I don't write code. And sure. you see that there's absolutely no code in this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But getting some developer involved and then paying for that one would cost mm -hmm. X amount of money and all of that. So that's that's kind of yeah, empowering the, the uh, end users and empowering more ITs and and uh, let's say power users like you, Teresa, on on being successful and and that is absolutely why the power platform is so cool. Uh, so normal users can be super efficient on it. Cool. Thank you, Teresa, on that one. Mm -hmm.